then we get a style like a diary that's sort of like Samuel Pepys. It is, um, we learn a little more about the father of, of the Purfoy baby that's going to be born, who is not at the hospital. He's over 50, he's a Methodist, and they have, I think, nine other kids and three have died, or one, maybe eight and one has died. I don't remember. A lot of them, a lot of kids, a lot have died. Pretty typical for Ireland of the time when birth control was illegal, not just unavailable, but illegal because, you know, Catholic country. So this is uh, not atypical. Lenahan informs Stephen that uh, the letter that uh, DC gave Stephen, that he gave to the newspaper uh, people, it was published in the newspaper that night. Lenahan kind of tries to find it to show Stephen. Stephen doesn't really seem to care. Obviously, he barely wanted to deliver the letter, so I don't think he really cares about seeing it published. What's interesting to me about it is that how much has happened in this day. Like that letter was given to Stephen that morning and it's already published that day. Like how quickly that process happened. Also at this point, Lenahan and Costello, they're described not just as layabouts, but really as almost roguish, like almost criminal. And, uh, but that may just be the lens of that narration. It's hard to say. DC's letter, you may remember, was about foot and mouth disease, which was affecting a lot of cattle in Ireland at the time. And this uh, will lead to them talking about all these cattle that have to be slaughtered. And I think this is a reminder once again of the oxen of the sun, how these cattle are slaughtered. Instead of Odysseus in the Odyssey being angry at the men for doing disobeying the gods, Bloom is instead, he feels you know a great deal of pity for all these animals that have to be slaughtered. The bulls also lead to uh, connecting it to the Pope, and the section is uh, gets pretty historical and nuanced. You don't necessarily need to know all the details to move forward. Then Buck Mulligan arrives. He's with this guy Alec Bannon. They are both coming from that soiree that we referred to back in Skill and Charybdis that happened at Thomas More's house that evening that Stephen was kind of sort of not invited to. The name Bannon may ring a bell. He's the guy who's putting the moves on Bloom's daughter, Millie. When he arrives, I don't think Bloom or Bannon realize who the other character is, <laughs> that um, Bloom doesn't know that he's the, the guy that Millie was referring to, and Bannon certainly doesn't know that Bloom is her father, but I think by the end of the episode, both of them will know. Then Mulligan humorously explains his plan to set up fertilizing farms to impregnate any woman who might need his services, and, um, be they rich or poor, he will, he will, you know, what a humanitarian, what a, what a wonderful guy. Mulligan also <laughs> rather uh, passive aggressively asks Bloom if he needs any help. What a, what a subtle way of asking Bloom, why are you here, dude? You're, you don't, you're not part of our group. But Bloom seems to naturally be aware, even without Simon Dedalus's uh, warning that Mulligan's a rogue. He just, I mean, he just heard his fertilizing plan, so I don't think he has any uh, illusions about Mulligan being a gentleman. As Bannon talks, it becomes apparent that he is the one who is seeing Millie. It's a reference is made to her new cap that I think Bloom or Molly gave her for her birthday in the letter that she wrote to Bloom in the early in Calypso. The men talk about sex and how they obtain condoms but you might easily miss it on your first read if you're not looking for it because they use such veiled language as a lot of people probably had to do at the time. I know a marchand de capote, Monsieur Points, from whom I can have for a livre as snug a cloak of the French fashion as ever kept a lady from wedding. A cloak being a condom, of course. A phrase shows up around here, vacant hilarity, and I think this is a pretty good, um, a good uh, feeling for how Bloom may be feeling about this whole situation. Nurse Callan enters and suddenly all the men, because unlike Nurse Quigley, she's a younger woman, and suddenly the men are all like, they're not, not, not joking around at all. She whispers something to Dixon and after she leaves, the men kind of joke that, oh, Dixon, you're getting it on with her, aren't you? And he takes offense to that. I, my impression is that he's not drinking or not drunk anyways. As, as much as the other men, and he's also kind of working. And I think the reason he has to leave is that the baby has been born, so he's going to be leaving, and he kind of scolds the men and takes off. Bloom is getting a lot of subtle pokes at him from some of the men 
who definitely see him as an outsider. Also the fact that he's not really drinking, he's not really engaging in this rowdy atmosphere like the other men. Implications are also made that Mina Purfoy's husband is not necessarily the father of her child. This may be uh, striking a nerve with Bloom. It certainly echoes what we heard in Cyclops when Bloom took off. They made a lot of jokes at Bloom's expense that, that Molly was uh, slipping around and that Bloom wasn't the father of the children. The narrator doesn't have sympathy either with Bloom. This is Again, an example of Bloom being as an outsider, not uh, taking part in his familial duty to procreate and brief, be fruitful and multiply. There's also this reference that we're going to learn more about next episode, that he tried to somehow put the moves on a domestic servant that the Blooms once had. He says this, a censor of morals, a very pelican in his piety, who did not scruple oblivious of the ties of nature, to attempt illicit intercourse with a female domestic drawn from the lowest strata of society. Nay, had the hussy's scouring brush not been her tutelary angel, it had gone with her as hard as with Hagar, the Egyptian. We'll learn more about that in the next episode, Circe. Finally, it is announced that Mrs. Purfoy has given birth. There's a long section about pregnancy, but we can add this to our list of coincidences. What are the odds that a woman who has been in labor for three days, that the hour that two of our main characters arrive in the hospital, she gives birth. Then Haynes arrives. He mysteriously appears from a sliding panel. And I'm told that this is in the style of the Castle of Otranto. I have not read that book, but I would love to after reading this ridiculous passage. It is revealed, you know, revealed, quote unquote, that he is the murderer in the uh, child's murder case that we've had referred to a few times in the book. And clearly he is not the murderer, but I think Joyce is trying to pack as many fake solutions into this, this little, uh, the style of this, this episode is kind of like a, a whodunit and the revelation of these these mysteries are finally solved. This kind of a big reveal is not the kind of book that Ulysses is. I think I'm going to do a special episode about Macintosh and all these other mysteries that Joyce has thrown at us. Maybe it'll be my final episode, but I want to address this because I think uh, this is an example of the narrative so completely twisting the actual factuality of what is happening that we need to be very suspicious. Also some hilarious lines. Dope is my only hope. Ah, destruction, the Black Panther. With a cry, he suddenly vanished and the panel slid back. An instant later, his head appeared in the door opposite and said, meet me at Westland Row Station at 10 past 11. He was gone. Tears gushed from the eyes of the dissipated host. What's important to note in this section is that as Haynes leaves, he tells Mulligan to meet him at the train station at 11.10. The last train, according to the annotations, is 11.15. If they don't catch that train, they're like, I forget how many miles. Is it like seven miles from the downtown? It's a long way. They're not going to walk that. And if they don't catch that train, they're screwed. So uh, the important thing to note is that Mulligan's going to catch that train. Haynes is going to catch that train. Stephen is going to be drunk and going to the brothel. He's not going to be on that train. So how is he going to get back? Where is he going to stay that night? And then we get a completely different style with this paragraph that starts, What age is the soul of man? These jumps in style are almost as ridiculous as the styles themselves. And this style is in the style of Charles Lamb. That name you may remember from way back in the five books that you must read before Ulysses episode I did episode two, I mentioned Charles Lamb as the author of the children's book, The Adventures of Ulysses, Joyce's first exposure to Ulysses. Joyce is going to be using his style here. These authors who Joyce cites or mentions a lot, be they Charles Lamb or Lord Byron, you remember in Portrait of the Artist, Stephen says Byron is the best poet or something. And then Charles Dickens, Arthur Conan Doyle, Bur Bulwer Lytton, Walter Scott, Thomas Aquinas. I'm not saying Joyce loves these authors at the time of writing Ulysses, but a lot of them are, I think these are really breadcrumbs to understanding Joyce's development. I think everybody goes through phases and authors that they like. 
and I think it behooves you if you really like Joyce and you want to understand Ulysses and Joyce's mind to understand uh, or Ibsen for example was a big influence on his sense of drama but I think he, he he's outgrown a lot of them but I think at least be somewhat aware of who these people are and what their styles are like. This Charles Lamb section though is one of my favorites. I think it has a style to it that is reminds me of old movies like uh, or old stories like A Christmas Carol, uh, Citizen Kane, It's a Wonderful Life. Those that sense of time travel when it was more misty and organic and less electrical. And I also love how this part about a mirror in a mirror, hey presto, is mirrored itself further down the page. We learn some more about Bloom's backstory. We see him in high school and then we see him as some kind of traveling salesman for the family firm we are told. I was really letting loose with my speculation wondering like is it like chronologically even possible that Bloom is not just uh, figuratively like a father figure for Stephen but literally his father. Could he have somehow impregnated Stephen's mother. This is the kind of wild speculation that I, I do when I read Ulysses. I don't think it's possible. We learn about Bloom losing his virginity to a prostitute named Bridie Kelly and the narrator really plays on this as his bride knight and I think about how no heir is going to be produced as if he's going to have a child with the prostitute. We get a few paragraphs about this transitioning feminine identity that seems to move from Molly to Millie. Uh, there's a lot about constellations and astrology. I do not claim to understand it at all, but it's very beautifully written. A paragraph begins, Francis was reminding Stephen of years before when they had been at school together in Conmay's time. I was like, who's Francis? And then I remembered it's Punch Costello. He, Lynch, and Lenahan are going to be playfully uh, teasing Stephen about his aspirations to be a great artist, but they also acknowledge that answer and those leaves, Vincent said to him, will adorn you more fitly when something more and greatly more than a capful of light odes can call your genius father. All who wish you well hope this for you. All desire to see you bring forth the work you meditate, to acclaim you Stephaneforus. I heartily wish you may not fail them, Oh no, Vincent Lenahan said, laying a hand on the shoulder near him. Have no fear. He could not leave his mother an orphan. You can feel the pressure, the obligation on Stephen to deliver into the world something from his genius. Then we transition to some talk about the horse race that day and some names that may show up that are a little confusing. Phyllis and Lalage. I guess these are in ancient times traditional names for beautiful maidens. As we connect this talk about the creative imagination with birth, one of my favorite lines in this episode, it is as painful perhaps to be awakened from a vision as to be born. If, as I've suggested, Joyce's role is to uh, create epiphanies for the reader or whatever the art form is, the observer of that art form, then his, his obligation can be seen as is a painful process. Lynch is going to mention how he ran into Conmi that afternoon. You remember in Wandering Rocks, this is another coincidence, just as they're talking about Conmi, they mention how he ran into him that day. Some of these paragraphs are so good at communicating the drunken state of mind, and one of them is describing the scene, but I realized it, it really is a uh, microcosm. Uh, it could be describing Ulysses as a whole. The debate which ensued was in its scope and progress an epitome of the course of life. Neither place nor council was lacking in dignity. The debaters were the keenest in the land. The theme they were engaged on the loftiest and most vital. The high hall of Horn's house had never beheld an assembly so representative and so varied, nor had the old rafters of that establishment ever listened to a language so encyclopedic. With each shift in style, I think a lot of times we get a reassessment of the characters which gives us more details about who they actually are. There's a long passage about health conditions in the style of T.H. Huxley. The role of the woman in childbirth is consistently put as uh, below that of the man. All that surgical skill could do was done, and the brave woman had manfully helped. She had. 
Congratulations to the husband for all his hard work. An interesting point is made about sins being uh, referred to as uh, evil memories. And this reminds me of the dead and how conceptions of uh, what a ghost is. A ghost is something that lives within us. And I think similarly with sins, the things that we do that we regret, those are uh, sins that what end up being evil memories that haunt us. Heaven or hell in this sense is something within us, not something out in the world. We get a little flashback to Bloom and Molly meeting at this guy, Matt Dillon, a friend of theirs, his house, and their three daughters, their names are Flowey, Addie, and Tiny. I mean, apparently those are Matt Dillon's daughters. I don't know how you would get that from the text. There's also a reference to a young lad of about four or five. And if I remember correctly, in a few episodes, we're going to get this confirmed. This is young Stephen Dedalus. So another coincidence, if he happens to have been there on the night when they met. With the birth being over, the men decide to go to a nearby pub, uh, Burks. And as they leave, there's a phrase, a daedal of lusty youth. A daedal is from French, it's a maze. Daedal is a word derived from Daedalus who made the labyrinth in the ancient myth. Bloom leaves as well to follow the group and check on Stephen. And as he's leaving, he says goodbye to Nurse Callan and asks her, when are you gonna have kids? Further congratulations are heaped on Theodore Purfoy, the father. By heaven, Theodore Purfoy, thou hast done a doughty deed and no botch. Thou art, I vow, the remarkablest progenitor, barring none in this chaffering, all including most faraginous chronicle. Never mind the mother who is in labor for three days. Then the final few pages, which I find most challenging, are supposedly done in the, a contemporary slang-packed style, and the narration seems to have disappeared. It's, it's very confusing who is speaking, what is happening, but they are heading to Burke's. <laughs> Will Buck Mulligan's aunt write to Stephen's father, suggesting a reverse of what was suggested in Hades? Alec Bannon puts two and two together and realizes that Bloom is Millie's father. They seem to see once more that Macintosh fellow, that mysterious fellow, and I'm going to say more about him later on. There are sound effects near the end that go ook, yook, ook, blap. These seem to be someone vomiting or several someone's vomiting, probably at least Stephen vomiting. Finally, Stephen and Lynch head to the brothel pursued by Bloom like the panther that he is. Somebody in their drunken state or several somebodies see one of those posters of that Alexander uh, Doughty guy and uh, the revivalist uh, religious guy. And this poster almost seems to speak to them in this combination of advertising and coercion and high energy revivalism. The audiobook, which I do suggest you listen to for this episode, it reminds me a lot of the Firesign Theater. I'll say a little more about that later on in Penelope. We somehow made it through all these styles. Congratulations. If you are curious about every stylistic shift, I'm going to put a link down below to a website that does enumerate every style change and who the, the source of what Joyce is imitating. Uh, you don't need to know everyone, but they're, it's interesting to know, and they're in the annotations as well, but if you want an actual numbered list, they're down below. Now we're done. We're entering now into the next episode, which is Circe. This is the longest episode in the book. I'll see you there.